Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Family Law Talk. Family Law Talk. Presented by Kirk Stangy of Stangy Law Firm, PC. Stangy Law Firm is a family law firm with offices in Missouri and Illinois. Now, here's your host, Kirk Stangy. Welcome to Family Law Talk. We have an interesting topic today. The topic is supervised visitation and child custody. This is based on an article on FamilyLawHeadquarters.com. The date of the article is February 29, 2016, and the title of that article is How Does Supervised Visitation Work? So as a follow-up to the episode today, you can go to FamilyLawHeadquarters.com, and you could definitely read that article. That definitely has good, insightful information and would be a good follow-up to the episode today. So let's jump right in and let's talk about the topic. Uh, The reality is child custody cases are very difficult. Um, In lots of child custody cases, it might be amicable in nature where both parents are able to agree that uh, they're both going to have reasonable access or frequent and and meaningful uh, visitation with the kids, uh, and they're able to resolve the child custody case in an amicable way, maybe settled outside of court. Sometimes courts have to make determinations about child custody where the parties can't agree, and in the vast majority of the cases, uh, both parties are going to have visitation with the kids. Uh, The standard can really vary by state in terms of of really the exact verbiage. Um, In Missouri, it's frequent, continuing, and meaningful contact is is the starting point, the presumption, if you will, for both parents. Um, So in essence, shared custody. Frequent, continuing, and meaningful contact with both parents is what is is generally presumed. And again, look in the laws uh, in your particular state. Definitely consult with an attorney because there can be different nuances, different quirks in terms of exactly how child custody cases can play out and the factors that courts look at. Um, but in some cases, there might be a situation where there could be abuse that's alleged. Uh, there could be cases where one parent uh, has allegations of neglect against them uh, where uh, maybe the court, uh, maybe uh, an agency like Family Services has some concerns uh, that the kids are being neglected. Um, in some cases, uh, there could be the belief that maybe a parent needs some sort of parental training of some kind for some reason. Uh, and again, this could this could really vary based on the facts of the case. Um, But either way, there's some cases, and again, these are generally rare circumstances. Uh, This generally doesn't happen often, um, but it is something that's out there, and it can take place ultimately in some cases, which is a court could order supervised visitation uh, with the kids. So it could be both parents, uh, their visits are supervised. It could be just one of the parents. In other words, the court could have a concern about uh, either the mom or the dad, uh, but maybe not. Maybe there's not a concern about both the parents, and so the court orders supervised visitation. And supervised visitation uh, generally uh, sort of falls into two camps. In other words, sometimes while a case is pending, uh, a, a court might order supervised visitation while the case is pending, so they can monitor how the visits are going. And the hope in a lot of these cases can be that the supervised visitation is temporary, like it's not a permanent thing, it's not part of the final court order or judgment, but it's temporary in nature so the court can see how the visits are going. Um, It might be a situation, again, where a parent is undergoing some kind of parental training, maybe the kids are in counseling or therapy, Uh, maybe the parent is in some sort of counseling or therapy, Uh, and the hope ultimately is to have unsupervised visitation at the conclusion of the case. So sometimes, Supervised visitation can be temporary. There can be some cases um, where the court might order supervised visitation on an indefinite basis. In other words, in the final order, the final judgment, let's say in a divorce or paternity case, the final judgment um, indicates that uh, one parent's visits are going to be supervised, for example. Um, So sometimes that can take place. And again, these are rare cases. Uh, Generally speaking, Uh, You look at circumstances where uh, the physical health of the kids uh, might be jeopardized or or maybe their emotional development could be significantly impaired if the visits are unsupervised. I mean, generally, uh, those are things the courts are looking at. And, again, you've got to check the laws in your state. Uh, The laws can vary quite a bit. 
Um, but physical impairment, emotional development, if there's some significant concern, the court may uh, order supervised visitation. And again, not terribly common, but sometimes it happens. And so what we wanted to do in this episode is break down how supervised visitation may work in terms of sort of the different varieties of supervised visitation. Um, and again, this could be part of a final order, or maybe it could be part um, of a temporary order that takes place while the case is pending and, and the court's ultimately monitoring it. And again, we're speaking generally. Obviously, the laws in each state can vary. Uh, there can be different uh, quirks by jurisdiction, so you definitely want to talk to a lawyer who's licensed and competent to practice law in your specific jurisdiction. Uh, but let's sort of break this down in terms of uh, uh, different varieties of supervised visitation that might be out there, and in a general sense, talk about um, sort of the differences between them and what maybe some parties might view as pros and cons uh, of different types of supervised visitation. So uh, scenario one is a scenario where uh, the courthouse personnel are monitoring the visits. Now, not every jurisdiction has uh, maybe the personnel or the facilities to actually do this, um, but in some jurisdictions, uh, there might be the facilities in place, and there might be courthouse personnel who actually monitor the visits themselves. And so uh, in these cases, what you're looking at is a parent going to whatever the facilities are uh, in play in this specific jurisdiction. Uh, they do uh, the visitation uh, with their child or children uh, in this courthouse facility of some kind, so much more restricted uh, and then and the supervision is pretty stringent in that you have courthouse personnel there watching it, and then generally speaking, uh, they're reporting back in some capacity uh, to if there's a guardian ad litem in the case, where normally there would be if there's supervised visits, where they're reporting back to the guardian ad litem. Uh, in some jurisdictions, maybe there's a report back to the judge in terms of what they see. Again, this can vary. Um, but again, these are at courthouse facilities of some kind. Uh, maybe maybe the facilities aren't owned by the state, but somehow there's an arrangement uh, between the courthouse and that specific facility for the visitations to take place there. And again, these visits are uh, generally stringent in that <clears throat> you've got courthouse personnel there monitoring it. So generally the parents aren't leaving with the kids at these locations if the visits are supervised there. Again, this can vary um, in theory uh, in specific cases, but again, that's generally what you're looking at. Sometimes there can be a limit on the amount of time in these types of visits. In other words, if courthouse personnel is going to be monitoring it, um, uh, the time could be limited, for example. Hypothetically, maybe it's a one-hour visit, let's say, something in that variety. Maybe it's a little longer than that. Maybe it's a little shorter, but this is really scenario one, supervised visitations at a courthouse. Obviously, uh, parents who have supervised visitation at a courthouse may not like it to the extent uh, that it is uh, more stringent. It's taking place at a courthouse, and so it's very formal, and some parents in these instances don't uh, like having courthouse personnel uh, really monitoring the visit. On the flip hand, uh, if, the, if the one parent uh, has significant concerns about the parent whose visits are supervised, they might like this type of setting better because their viewpoint might be the children or the child is more protected in this type of circumstance, especially if we're talking situations where abuse is a, uh, being uh, alleged, uh, neglect being alleged, uh, the parent who is not supervised might uh, appreciate the courthouse personnel supervising the visits and, and feel good about it because they feel like there's safeguards and there's protections there uh, to ensure uh, that the visits are being monitored and that the kids' uh, best interests are being protected, right? Uh, some instances you hear about some really uh, drastic instances at time reported in the media where maybe there's a concern one parent might flee with the kids or something like that. Uh, again, uh, in these types of circumstances, you can have a more restricted courthouse, supervised type environment in these types of instances. And again, this is really scenario one, the most restrictive type at some sort of courthouse or courthouse location facility. Um, scenario two would be this, would be a circumstance where a private party uh, is allowed to supervise uh, the visitation. Um, 
And in these circumstances, uh, uh, again, it can vary by jurisdiction, but in a lot of these circumstances, it might be a, a former family uh, services uh, worker who supervises visits uh, for a fee um, and then reports back to the court. Uh, so that, that could be the scenario. It could be a scenario where maybe a mental health professional is supervising the visits and might be in their office, for example, like at a therapist office. Or, some, or, or something of that variety. Um, but again, it's a private party. Uh, it's not at a courthouse uh, or a courthouse facility, sanctioned facility of some kind. It's a private party supervising the visits. Um, and, and, and that's really scenario two. Um, uh, generally speaking, in terms of these visits, there's generally a cost involved. And again, this might not always be the case, but generally if a private party is going to supervise the visits, they're going to be they're going to be paid uh, to do it. Uh, so the parent whose visits are being supervised might like the fact that this isn't at a courthouse. These visits or a courthouse uh, sanctioned facility. Um, they might like the fact that it's a private party versus courthouse personnel monitoring it. Uh, but the dilemma can be for them on the flip end. Uh, that there's a cost involved, uh, generally a fee for the supervision of the visits, and and the fee sometimes uh, to a parent going through a custody case might be more than they would wish it to be. Um, uh, in some of these instances, too, uh, these visits by private parties can take place out of an office setting. For example, some some supervisors uh, out there might be willing to uh, uh, go to uh, a location with the parent and the kids, like a fun location, like maybe go to a movie with the kids, maybe take the kids to a park, um, you know, in other words, a less restrictive environment. And again, in these types of circumstances, um, there's a little more flexibility in that regard. So, you know, from a from a pro perspective, uh, it's less restrictive. Uh, it's not taking place at a courthouse or courthouse sanctioned facility. Potential con to some would be the cost involved um, in a visit like this. Um, it can cost quite a bit more money. If one parent is significantly concerned about the other parent, in other words, if there's a concern uh, about abuse or neglect, maybe there's a flight risk concern, uh, the parent who isn't supervised and has concerns about the parent who is supervised, they might think this is too informal. Uh, they might be simply more comfortable with uh, visits taking place at a courthouse uh, than taking place or a courthouse sanctioned facility than being in, in, in uh, locations outside of a courthouse, for example. But again, this is kind of scenario two. Uh, the third scenario, uh, which is somewhat common and which can take place at times, uh, are circumstances where family members um, or other individuals that the court uh, trust uh, can supervise the visitation. So it could be friends, could be family members, uh, somebody who the judge trusts, who the judge feels good about. Some circumstances, it could be a grandparent, for example, uh, maybe supervising their child and grandchildren to ensure the visits are going well. And obviously, this is the less formal type of supervised visitation um, that's sort of out there. Uh, pros to some would be there's generally not a cost, right? If a friend or family member is going to agree to supervise the visits, uh, there's generally not a cost involved in terms of having this take place. Obviously, it's a lot um, uh, less formal. It's a lot less restricted. Uh, generally speaking, these types of visits could take place anywhere as long as that supervisor is there and present and, and abiding by the court order. Um, so you've got that component to it. On the flip end, if one parent has a significant concern about the other parent, which has resulted in that parent having supervised visits, they might not like this. Um, in some cases, they might be concerned about how well the visits are actually being supervised. Uh, they might be concerned uh, about the friend or family member in terms of how well these visits are actually being monitored or whatnot. Uh, but again, this is really sort of the third scenario. So again, three scenarios uh, in terms of supervised visits, in terms of common scenarios. These are them. Obviously, uh, supervised uh, visitation Difficult for parties, uh, difficult for children in a lot of respects. Sometimes it's necessary, however, to protect the best interests of the kids. And then ultimately the court has to weigh if the visits need to be supervised. Is it going to be temporary? Is it going to be permanent? And then 
past that, then you're looking at these circumstances, which is, is it going to take place at a courthouse or a courthouse-sanctioned facility, if that's even available in a specific jurisdiction, or uh, is the visit going to be through a private party or some kind of agency, like I said, maybe a formal family services worker, maybe a mental health professional of some kind. Uh, that would be a scenario. And then the final scenario, uh, in terms of at least what I've seen, are situations where designated friends or family members might ultimately be the supervisor. And ultimately, um, if supervised visits are warranted, uh, those are generally speaking the options uh, that the courts have out there and that are available to them. So interesting topic. Again, a uh, fairly rare circumstance, um, but it happens. Frankly, it happens. And frankly, there there are cases where the court ultimately uh, is ordering supervised visits in some capacity. So uh, definitely a topic we wanted to talk about, uh, definitely an interesting one. It is a follow-up to the episode again. Go to familylawheadquarters.com, read the article titled, How Does Supervised Visitation Work? The date of the article is February 29, 2016. That's the topic today. Stay tuned to our next topic coming up on Family Law Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Family Law Talk with Kirk Stange. Visit StangeLawFirm.com for more about today's topic or to put Stange Law Firm to work for your family today. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision that should not be based solely upon advertisements. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri or Illinois reviews or approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The information you obtain on this podcast is not, nor is it intended to be legal advice. You should contact an attorney for advice regarding your individual situation. We invite you to contact us and welcome your calls, letters, and electronic mail. Contacting us does not create an attorney-client relationship. Please do not send any confidential information to us until such time as an attorney-client relationship has been established. And finally, past results afford no guarantee of future results, and every case is different and must be judged on its own merits. Kirk Stange is responsible for the content. Principal Place of Business, 120 South Central Avenue, Suite 450, Clayton, Missouri, 63105. Treat your party host with a high V party tray. From meat, cheese, and charcuterie boards to shrimp and seafood trays and everything in between, hy V has the perfect signature platter to make your event extra special. And make sure to check out the chicken wing trays if you want a real crowd pleaser. Shop in store or online at hi-v.com. That's hi-v.com. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. You could do a classic herb roasted turkey or spice it up and make turkey tacos. Serve up a go-to shrimp cocktail or use Simple Truth wild caught shrimp for your first Cajun risotto. Make creamy mac and cheese or a spinach artichoke fondue from our selection of Murray's cheese. No matter how you shop, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace all your holiday traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone.